Today, I'm joined by trainer extraordinaire Keith Williams. Please introduce yourself to the people, sir. How you doing? My name is Keith Williams, and I'm, I'm happy to be on this podcast. Thanks for joining us. So if you could just take us back to the beginning of when you started to play basketball, you've had a long career and you a long playing career, and then you transitioned that into an actual uh, training career. Can you just start from the beginning? Yeah, pretty much. And in 1986, as you probably already know, we won a state championship from Crossland High School. And we had a great team. Uh, a, a, a teammate of mine was Walt Williams. He, he was in the 10th grade at that time. And uh, we knew he was going to be an NBA player then. But anyway, I went on to uh, win the state championship. And right after that, uh, I went to uh, the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Mm -hmm. While I University. While at University of Maryland, I was uh, uh, I averaged 20 a game as a freshman. I was the second leading the freshman score in the nation behind Mark Macon. I'm sure everybody can remember was at uh, Temple University. Mm -hmm. And while my team, you know, wasn't great, I had, you know, individual well yeah, all years. I had some academic troubles on. Um, as a junior, and only played half the year. And then I went on to, uh, you know, be back to Black College All America two years in a row. And uh, I ended up playing in the, at that time, it was very prestigious, the uh, Paul Smith invitation for, for all seniors. Mm -hmm. so, so prior to, to going to UMES, to uh, Eastern Shore, did you have any other offers coming out of Crossland? I did, but I, I wasn't. I wasn't the most focused student, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I really, my head really in the clouds about basketball. And so I really didn't focus on school. I was a, a really smart kid, but I just didn't, like a lot of kids today, I just didn't focus on it. And so initially I was a Prop 48. Okay. They don't have that. They don't even have that anymore. But my year was the first year that the um, that they had the Prop 48. That's That was the year it went into existence, 1986. And it was also right. the year that they brought the uh, three-point line into existence. So that was a, a historical year in, in the basketball community. That was, a, that was a big year. So was there any particular reason why you chose Eastern Shore? Or how did you – was it the HB, HBCU experience speaking, or what was it about Eastern Shore? Honestly, I should have went to Allegheny Community College. That's where I should have went. Mm -hmm. But said I, I went to visit you and me us, and uh, anybody knows anything about black colleges? It was, it was heaven. It was heaven. Right. So, I went on and committed, and uh, it wasn't a bad decision as a whole. But at that very moment, I, I probably should have went to junior college. Mm hmm. And so you you went four years at UMES, and did you you how do you kind of look back on that experience going to an HBCU now? Was it I mean, it was, no, it was beneficial because I had I learned to do everything on the court. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I had to be the best rebounder. Sometimes I had to be the best defender, and I'm I'm mostly known for scoring and shooting the ball, but uh. I became a much more well-rounded player. I think that's why today the Damon Lillers, the Steph Currys are actually the best players, Kawhi Leonard, because the schools they go to, they can't hide. Right. They have to do, they have to do all the work. And it, makes you better when you, it makes you better when you get around other really good players, and, and now you don't have to do all that work. Mm-hmm. Eastern showing the MEAC at that time also? Yep, still in the MEAC to this day. Yes, sir. Okay, so you said you were a Black College All-American. So what was the next step for you? Uh, I went to Paul Smith, played pretty good. Not mm -hmm. great, but I played pretty good. And then um, saw a couple that they wasn't going to draft me, but they were willing to uh, bring me to camp. And that was the Indiana Pacers. And uh, uh, at that time, New Jersey Nets. So, and for what position? Two guard, combo guard, point guard? What were they looking for you to do exactly in, in the pro role? 
at, at that time, I was supposed to be a point guard, but at that time, they were starting to make the point. They wanted their point guards to be a lot taller. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, I did well in camp, and it was the greatest experience that uh, that I've ever had in basketball because I was at the highest level. I was there with Draws and Petrovic, and I, you know, where he was in, he in his heyday before you know he, you know, he died on the Audubon two years after. Right. With the net. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that was a great experience because every day I played against one of the best players in the world, you know. So it was a great experience. And were you there with Kenny Anderson during that particular time? Ken, yeah. So Kenny Anderson got drafted number two the same year I came to the They had uh, Derek Coleman, uh, Jocelyn Benjamin, Terry Mill, uh, Raphael Addison, Joe Bush. Yeah there in camp with me so can you so can you kind of talk about like what is it like in that camp environment where you have a player at the same position who may have been a high lottery draft pick but here you are an undrafted player who's trying to make the team like do you guys get to go head to head do you get to compete against that player or is it more so a separate group how does that kind of what is that dynamic like at that time I played against everybody I remember I'm, I'm, I'm ancient <laughs> 51. So at that time, yeah, everybody everybody pretty much played against each other. And I was blessed enough to, when I first got down uh, to New Jersey, with Kirk Lee, who was a year ahead of me. You know, he just, mm-hmm. he had just made the team uh, coming from Towson. He kind of told me to set up. And he, you know, he kind of told me he was a good guy to try to, you know, break into the league under, you know what I mean? Because he was also, right. you know, small college type guy. So, uh, no, nah, it was good. I played against those guys, uh, even in rookie, you know, even in summer camp and all that. I played against all that guy because the team wasn't very good. So it wasn't like they had all these established stars and they don't play in this and they don't play in this. Everybody was there. Everybody was there. Oh, okay. So did that did that experience in those camps did that kind of help you or give you like a heads up as far as doing anything overseas? No, no, for sure it did, and, and, and it was it was a good camp for me because uh, Tay George was also and, Connecticut, right? And Tay George was the guard I played against college game at UConn. Mm-hmm. My first college game scored twenty nine points. And so I felt comfortable playing against Tate George. I knew that, you know, he wasn't as good as probably advertised. You know what I mean? Yeah, good size and right. all that, but it wasn't nothing really special about him. So I felt comfortable in playing against him. But yeah, being in camp at that time definitely uh, sparked sparked up interest with the overseas. So after that NBA experience, you did you go overseas? I did. I I went. I went. I went actually on a tour with uh, Mark Tillman over to the Philippines, and I and I did mm. great. You know, I was I was all been a score. You can go back even in the Kenner League. You know, I always average you know thirty points a game. So when I went over there, I didn't bring a lot of clothes with me. You know, I'm figuring you know I'm gonna go play some ball for about four or five days and come right back. And um, they was ready to take me right then and there. <laughs> they was like, mm-hmm. worry about nothing. I'm like, I ain't really got no clothes. They're like, don't worry about it. We'll get you clothes. And at that time, the Philippines was, wasn't like it is now. You know, it, was, it, was a, it wasn't a war-torn country, but they didn't have a lot of money. And, you know, it, it was a tough, tough, tough country to be in. But they showed me nothing but love when I was over there. So, it was, you know, it was excellent. It was excellent. Situ- first situation so, for me. Mm-hmm. So, so how long did you stay playing the Philippines? So I ca- I came back, you know, chucking and jiving like kids do, and and then I and then I went back over and played for a year. Oh, okay. And, and and that relationship with Mark Tillman was that something you had prior to the tour? Yeah, yeah. I played against him in the Kenner. And we would tease each other about which one shot the most. And we mm-hmm. always talked about this old guy uh, by the name of Machine Gun Kelly. And he was a guy. Mm-hmm. 
led the country in scoring in college. Like, he might have been 10 years old enough. So we were seven. So, yeah, I built a great relationship with Mark, Mark Tillman and them during that time, almost to the point where Mark and them used to invite me to the uh, private, super private uh, Georgetown workouts on Saturdays and Sundays. And uh, quick, quick mm. story, I was playing with those guys and being a shooter scorer. Uh, the Kimbe was out playing Pat, and Pat was on my team. And Pat was trying to post up for the game point, but I knew the way the rules were. If 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 I lose, they stay and stay on the court. If I lose, I gotta sit for right. two three games. So Pat's calling for the ball, and I'm like, man, get out of there, man, get out of there. And he wouldn't move, so I shot it and made it. You you tried to clear out Patrick Ewing at Georgia. I did, I did, I did, I did. <laughs> I did. And so, what happened was, uh, Big John called me, yelled my name, Keith. You know, he got that really booming voice. And I was like, man, mm-hmm. what's going to happen now? He was like, why you ain't pass that ball? And I told him, you know, I was a kid, you know, nineteen, twenty. I was like, if if if, if we lose. I'm going to have to sit down. I didn't want to sit down. So, ultimately, Big John told me. I, I felt bad, but I, I understood. Like like your your statement, you tried to clear out Pat at Georgetown, but my, right. my thought was basketball. It had nothing to do with who he was. It had everything to do with the Kim Bays outplaying you. And more than likely, the Kim Bay might block your shot. So, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. So he, um, he, but you he sent me home. But you hit the shot. I did. I did. You hit the shot. You you won the game, and he and Coach still John made you pack up. And... Yep, still had to go. So I saw him wow. at the Kenner. I saw him at the Kenner League weeks later, and you know I was killing the kid. Like I say, the two years I played the kid, I always averaged at least thirty. I mean, one year thirty-four, the other year thirty-two, and. He saw me. He yelled my name again. I was like, "Man, what now?" You know what I mean? You, you know, I put me out. Of the gym. You thought he was gonna put you out the kitchen too? I ain't know what he was gonna say, but he was like, <laughs> he was like, "So, Q, you, you just, you just not gonna pass." It. I was like, "Coach, I, I'm not gonna say I won't pass it, but I'm just saying if I feel like I got a better, you know, opportunity to make it, I'm gonna take it." Right. Like, you know what? You, you, you can come back with Mark. So it, it was one of those, it was one of those situations that you know come about where you, you got to establish who you are as a basketball player. And I figured, look, I ain't a part of the Georgetown thing anyway. So I guess if they put me out, they put me out. I just I wanted to establish that, man. I wanted to win. And like I said, the Kimbang was, you know, knowing what I know now, Pat probably wasn't in great shape. You know what I mean? And the Kimbang probably was. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the summertime. But I, I, I right. Too, so. Yeah, but I think that shows a lot of res- respect that Coach may have had for you afterwards that he invited. Oh you no back. question. I mean he, I mean he would later when I was doing an interview with uh, I was doing I was doing a ESPN special with Demarcus Cousins. He would later uh, help me again when you know everybody was kind of on Demarcus Cousins' back. He was like, I rather I would rather have a fool. Somebody got, I got to turn down, then a pussycat, a player that I got to turn up. So he was, he was yeah, he was right. really beneficial to 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 getting helping us get through that 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 point. Because ESPN, as you know, they you know they like to tell the negative stories. You know, because they they all about clicks. And we were we weren't yeah. really prepared for what we were thinking. They was doing a really really nice story on us. Because they had just done the thing with Blake Griffin and Blake Griffin's trainer had the mask on and all that craziness. So we was we, we right behind them. This is gonna be good. And ultimately it turned into them trying to, you know, talk bad about the markets. So having Big John part of that interview was paramount to us getting through that. And at least, you know, coming out, you know, even, not ahead, but at least even you know, what Big John says matters. Right. So let's go back for a second. You you did a year in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. So anything anything after that? No, I had, I had a son. And so I had to make a decision. And, and one thing, I wanted to be a dad. 
And so I came on back. And then about two years after that is kind of when I, I started being a trainer. So at what age would you say you started to become a trainer? Right around 26. So at that time, was training what is what we kind of perceive it to be today, or were you kind of at the forefront of that, like in our area? Nah, it was at that time. It was only two, maybe three trainers in the whole area, um, and that was myself and a guy by the name of Willie Diggs. He didn't works out out of Virginia, and his set his mm-hmm. setup was kind of more of a more of a like working with younger kids. And, mm-hmm. then, and then you had a guy that was out of Virginia that coached me at AAU, which was Reggie Kitchens. And he did Coach he, he did things to be and his was serious, but he you know, he was out of Virginia. And then you had the older, older guys um that did, did some stuff up at uh up at uh Boys State. Did some, did some training. That was pretty much it. It wasn't it really wasn't a viable thing at that time. But Right, but I, I, you know, by being in camp, and at the time when I went to camp, Rick Carlisle was the low assistant with New Jersey at the time, and I was kind of like his guinea pig. You know what I mean? Keep you, you want to make the team, mm-hmm. don't you? I'm like, yeah, he like, come on in and, and, and get this extra work. And so what happened was, I think he would test his drills out on me. You know, and right. I'm, I'm very thankful that he did that because. I learned a lot about skill training and, and, and what it takes to, you know, what it, what are the steps that it takes to uh, to help a kid improve their game. So you started to train. Where any particular area? Were you DC? Were you PG? I know you weren't in the Northern Virginia area, but were you based in both, or how did that work for I you early on? I was just right in my backyard in Sea Pleasant at the time. Um, Troy Weaver was moving about and he was, you know, getting to the pro ranks and he would bring guys in or Moochie Norris and different guys and be like, at that time it wasn't considered training. He, he would just be like, Keith, you know, man, play him one on one or, you know, show him how you, you know, show him how you get free on your jump shot, you know. So it was kind of a, it wasn't even a business at that point. It was just kind of, you know, like, like the old days, an older ball player. You know, working with young guys. Tricks to the that's trade. It, that's, it. that's it. I hadn't even so, I because, had to monetize it at that point. Because you were still 26. You were actually still a playing age. I was age. still playing. I was so, still playing locally. Right. Like I said, I was a dad at that point. And then I had another son, uh, you know, four and a half months after him. So I was locked in in that. And really trying to, yeah, really mm-hmm. trying to find myself. Like, okay, what do I want to do? And, and we would, you know, it would be situations come about uh, right after the New Jersey, after the overseas thing. Indiana Pacers had reached out and wanted me to come to camp. And I was with my best friend at the time, Mike White, who also played, you know, played in the backcourt with me in high school. And it was right there when I got the phone call. Um, and my agent at the time, Mike Gons, guy out of Chicago, was like, what you want to do, you know? And I didn't want to say no in front of everybody. So I made them think that I was um, I was uh, still going to go. And I just kind of, you know, waited it out until the time passed. And then I just admitted, like, man, it ain't what I thought it was. I thought I should have been an NBA player. You know, I, I had played, you know, in college at the lower level. I know what that's like, catching buses everywhere. And, you know, I just didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. I just didn't want to do it. You, you so you ultimately you chose family over the professional rank. But looking back, it was it, I gave up on my dream too soon. Got it. Because you still were playing age, still were playing in shape, but it's just I guess that's the father role kicked in, and you said, you know what, I'm good where I am. Definitely, I definitely got to take care of these little boys. Um, yeah. But but you know it opened the door for what you know what I was going to do. And what I've become even better at, and that, you know, and that's training. So, yeah, it wasn't a lot of – it wasn't a lot of training. Oh, the other older guy I was telling you about who was actually doing the training was Eddie Myers. I know, I know you've heard of him. He was, was doing mm-hmm. training in the area. And that was it. That was it. It was no other trainers throughout the DMV. 
Uh, Eddie Myers, myself, Willie Diggs, and Reggie Kitchens. So uh, you're now training. Well, we're really working guys out, I guess. And who were some of those first people, those first players that you kind of had when you started? Uh, I did some stuff with Tony Massenberg. I did stuff with Gerard Mustafa. Remember, these guys were my same age. So looking back now. Right. Yeah, I must have thought really highly of myself because you got against, you know. And right, and, but you know, it, it shows like people respect what you do. You know, a lot of times you don't know what the players think about you until you get older. Well, for me, oh, getting older was a lot quicker because I stopped playing. Those guys were still playing, and so they would come up to uh, uh, Boy State in in the small gym, which was the which was the Wizards practice facility for a long time and I would just you know do skills drills with these with these old guys for a good while I would say maybe eight months to a year before really you know I would you know they would share some you know money with me at times but I didn't really know what to charge you know again it wasn't a business it was really me right. hanging around the game and you know and sharing like that, you know, sharing what I thought about it. And um, so, yeah, Tony Master, I, I have a whole bunch. Of... And then the so, break. So you kind of yeah. mentioned, I'm sorry, you kind of mentioned Tony Masterberg and Gerard Mustaf. You you mentioned uh, some bigger guys. Um, with, I guess that didn't really matter. Were they trying to learn ball skills or – how did that training work early on for them? Well, you got to remember, in that day and time, everybody learned how to play at position. It wasn't like it is now where everybody kind of tried to remember. You know, guards learn how to post up. And for, bigs didn't handle the ball a lot, you know, but everybody learned how to right. post up. And I think that we skill player. More than position, I think they looked at it like, you know, he's pretty skilled. And at that time, a lot of my game was based on, you know, jabs and, you know, when I wasn't putting on the block, you know, I had a lot of pump fakes and jabs and stuff like, you know, step through. You know, because when you're a smaller scoring guard, you know, you, you kind of need to know everything because you don't have the height to just play over people. So, right, I was pretty skilled, and I think they respected that. And so you had – I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and the breakthrough was when – uh, Keith Feeney um, had the Nike job. And he would do some training with some of the guys that were signed to Nike or whatever, especially the local guys. And he began to send the young guys my way. Um, you know, Eton Thomas, you know, we're talking about all old guys now. Eton Thomas. Right. Um, um, Kwame when he first came in to came to DC, you know what I mean. So he because now name recognition not only with the older pros, the guys that weren't in the league anymore but had been in the league, but now you had a young cat that just had come, and all this really really helped me in my growth in the business. Because now, as you know, training is more than just the basketball side. It's, getting to know the people, the kids, and, you know, what what button to push and things of that nature to get the most out of each player. And I learned then that you got to build that really strong relationship with these guys. They got to trust you so they can be comfortable, you know, so that you can help them get better so they can be comfortable within the game. So is it at that time where, like you said, that's the breakthrough. Is that where you kind of – Said, you know what? This is definitely what I'm gonna do. So you you began to monetize it at that time. Well, I was I was actually working at uh, Sam's Club on 301. Mm-hmm. So I'm working at night, and I'm up, up Bowie State during the day. And my, you know, like most older people, like Keith, can you do? Can you lift boxes and do this and do that? You know, I was I was playing night. Like, do this for the next 20 years though which was a really good question you know what i'm saying and i mm-hmm. was like yeah, he right i can't you know what i mean the money was good i had a friend you know you know a basketball player i had a friend they hooked me up so i didn't i didn't do anything to 
to, I didn't have to fight through the ranks to get the job. You know, you got a degree, a guy, I'm going to get you this job. And so at that time, your question, I was like, I was going through the whole, you shouldn't quit a job before you got another job, right? And so I was going through those right. thoughts. But I also was going through like, uh, but I'm, I'm feeling, I really like what I'm doing and I think I can do something special. And ultimately, I quit. And I started, I just started to do the training uh, full time. Again, still not knowing what to charge, really. Uh, talking to Keith Vini a little bit because he was around NBA guys and kind of seeing what they was doing, uh, uh, what what guys would charge. And so ultimately, I I got frustrated and was like, man, you know, and I said, if I was a white boy, you know, man, y'all would have just went on and paid me, you know what I mean? Y'all treating me like the home, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the homeboy, like, man, they telling me how good the work is, but I ain't getting no money. So what I mm-hmm. did was I got a bag. I don't even know where I ever got the green, like the green, like duffel bag, you know, back then with us. And the duffel bag that you would bring your gym clothes in. And I said, man, just whatever y'all think I'm worth, just put it in. Because I finally, I didn't realize, but I finally broached the issue of getting paid. And I didn't, you know, I was young. Right. I didn't know how to really come at it except with an attitude. I had an attitude about, you know, them not paying me. So that's kind of how I broached the subject. So by doing that, then I said, well, I'm just going to bring this bag. I'm just going to put the bag in. You know, whatever y'all think I'm work. So, you know, first day, you know, I don't know, $65. You know, that ain't no money, but it, it was the beginning. You know what I mean? And 65 total, 60, 65 per player. By not total. I was a total. Remember, I didn't, I, oh, okay. I didn't give him a price. I just was like, you know, you know, give me what you think, you know, I deserve. Now, I didn't take into effect, you know, what cash they got them. I wasn't thinking nothing. Just trying to get it started because I didn't really know where I was trying to find my way around. Like most people, when you get into something where it's unprecedented what you're doing, you know, ain't no precedent set. I ain't know why you really can go to and say what it is. And that next week, I looked in the bag one day and I had like $345. And I was like, okay, see, now, now this is what I'm talking about. But I would I would accept it one fifty a day, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. But now now I started trying to figure out, okay, what do I charge? And ultimately, I ended up saying, look, if you're a certain level pro, I need fifty to seventy five a day. And anybody under them, mm-hmm. anybody under them at that time, I to accept twenty five dollars a workout. I didn't have any deals, any weekly, any monthly. Rate. It was day by day. And, you know, like anything else, once once you're in the gym and everybody knows you're in the gym, and then the Woolery State men's team at that time, they really liked me, and they liked the fact that I had pros there, and their guys were able to play against pros. So by this time, I mm-hmm. got, you know, Joe Forte. I got a lot of dudes, Roger Mason. You know, I got a lot of older guys, Chris Monroe, you know, the gym is back with talent, great talent. And um, so the Bowie State set up a way for me and my guys, you know, because I, I got so many people coming in the gym, then they worrying about somebody getting hurt and get sued. So they had a waiver pretty much right. set up with my Boy State, which you, you and I know is pretty much anything short of the building falling down is on you, you know what I mean? And yeah. that's kind of how it started. And, and, and the Boy State men's team backed me fully. Um, I pretty much had, you know, I ain't going to say 24-hour access, but at least 12-hour access to the gym, weight room, um, pool, you name it. They allowed me to kind of operate. And again, I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was making money. And I was, you know, starting to gradually really build my name, you know, and, you know, and so guys coming in, LaRon Props, and, and I know you were sitting there listening, like, a lot of old guys, like, a lot of guys was 40-some-odd years old. They were in there with me early in their career. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it grew. It grew. It grew. And my first big name was Steve Francis. So let's talk about that for a second. Your, your first big name is Steve Francis. So at what point were you training Steve? Was that prior to Maryland, prior to Allegheny, or prior to the NBA? No, right, right after he got in, he had, they had a trainer out of L.A. Mm-hmm. And they were using the facility. I just happened again. I'm I'm pretty much standing at Boise State all day, and and they um trainer wasn't coming in, and so Jason Muscuri would later he would later tell uh, the agent like, "Hey, I got a guy for us." And that day, yeah, Jason and Steve and Omar Cook. It was a bunch of guys in there. And after that first day, Steve kind of told his, you know, told his agent, this is who I want. This this is who I want to be the trainer. And from that one opp- from that one opportunity, uh, you know, I was able to kind of take off. And, and me and Steve were, you know, really, really close. And we did we did a lot of stuff together. So I in terms of as a whole, I owe everything to him, you know what I mean? Because he had he had just come off of being the rookie of the year. He hadn't really totally popped in the NBA, but you know he 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 did well. You know he was a he was a rising star in in the business. So when you have a, a player like that who's now your your actual trainer, like what like what what does that routine look like? I guess is it out of is it anything in season? Is it out of season? Like how do you go no, about was, training a player at that no, level? I, I was with him all the time. I, I went to uh, went I went to Houston. Uh, you know, I, we we used the facility. We also used this tennis club that uh, John Lucas. Used. Mm-hmm. Hello. No, I said I would fly out and, and and go with him all the time. So, so to Houston. Yep. So at that point, now you have Steve Francis as one of your clients. What, where do you go from there? Well, everybody with him kind of came along. So you got to remember, yeah, Elton Brain, all the guys, if you remember that times, all the guys that that been in the draft with him used to come to D.C. and play. Mm-hmm. Around. And, you know, kind of popping in the workouts because, you know, he was the guy, you know what I mean? So – so it, it kind of opened me to, to all types of opportunities, you know what I mean? Whether it be Houston top high school kids or, you know, I was open, you know what I mean? And Coach, yeah, yeah you're fading out right now. Can, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'll edit that part out, but can you repeat that? I was pretty much going to all the events with him. We Reebok stuff, all that. Mm-hmm. And so I was getting a chance to kind of rub elbows with pretty much everybody. There was anybody. And then he, um, the next big client I had was Shemeika Hosclaw. Shemeika yeah, Hosclaw. They were mm-hmm. dating a little bit. So he was telling her, Meek, you need to go with my trainer. So imagine that. Now I got probably the top young basketball player in the NBA. Now I got the number one pick and the best, at that time, the best women's basketball player in the world. Yeah. So. And this is before, this is way before she played in the D.C. Correct. area. Mm-hmm. So when we kind of look at your client list, you you know you you trained Steve Francis, Moochie Norris, Ty Lawson, Kevin Durant, Michael Beasley, um, John Wall. You pretty much touched the majority of the lottery picks from this area in training. Is there any one thing that stands out about players at that level that they may all have, or is it they're all very different? Or would you say they're all very different in their approach? They're all. This might sound crazy. They're all a little strange in their own way. You know what I mean? I think I think you gotta be a little strange to, you know, strive at that level for as long as all those players were able to strive. So 
I, I would say that they all had an ability to to have a oneness about them. And what I mean by that is to lock in on exactly what they're trying to do and 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 to be single minded in that that's that's what they're trying to do each and every day. Mm-hmm. So you you've had Steve Francis, you've had Moochie Norris, you've had John Wall. Yep. Right? So out of that out of those three, who would you say had the best handle? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would say I would say Steve was probably the most explosive with his handle. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because not only could he really handle it, but he really could move with it too. You know what I mean? The rest of the guys were grounded. He was going to be able to come to the basket with force with those handles. So I would say probably Steve. Okay. So you you also trained DeMarcus Cousins, That's my guy. Kevin That's Durant. My guy. DeMarcus Cousins is my guy. Kevin. I really learned the most about the business Ke- with him because, again, I had him, I had him from high school. So I was able. So we're we're gonna we're gonna definitely go back and talk on that. But just let me get the question. Off. You've had the Marcus Cousins, Michael Beasley, and Kevin right. Durant, and you've probably seen all of them at that high school yeah. level, right? Yeah. Who did you yeah. think at that time had the most potential to be the best NBA player at the high school level? Well, I'm gonna say high school and above. The best player is. Is the best player is the Marcus Cousins. Mm. If you more so, you go, yeah, because mm-hmm. if you go back and look at his ability and what he's doing at his size. So you can look at his tapes and see you can see him cross over people just like KD did, but you won't see you won't mm-hmm. see KD running over people like he did. And the story mm-hmm. with DeMarcus Cousins goes far because I got him, met him in 10th grade, and the plan was for him to play with D.C. Blue Devils, and I was going to try to put him on the wing. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was going to try to put him so, on the wing because when we had KD, the reason why we put KD on the wing was because he was so slim. There was no way he was going to be able to mm-hmm. survive in the post. So we, mm-hmm. we 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 played him at the four or five, but he was able to jump shot from the corner. That's kind of how we set set him up in those early days with the Blue Devils. And the coaches did a masterful job. Rob Jackson, everybody was in on it, realizing, hey, you know, this is what we got to do with this kid. So, so Demarcus Cousins was supposed to move here, play with the DC Blue Devils. What school were you guys thinking about putting the Marcus Cousins in? We weren't, we weren't even sure. But, you know, I, I just wanted to get him here. But, you know, he, his high school coach was great down in Alabama. They had a great, great program. So it was going to be tough to do it. But that was the plan. That was the plan. I spoke to his mom about it. You know, it, was a, it was a lot that went into dealing with the Marcus. Because first meeting him, the kid hated me. I mean, he barely spoke to me. His mom was cool with me, but he didn't speak to me. And, of course, y'all know him now. DeMarcus doesn't trust easy. So he thought I was just another right. grown man that might be trying to take advantage. And it wasn't until – it wasn't until um, one – was like, well, well, did you get these Jordans? You know what I mean? He was like, man, I don't even be getting the Jordans that Lance Stevenson and all them be getting. And so what I – Made sure I ordered some stuff off our order and stuff to make sure he got them. And that kind of opened the door for us to kind of communicate a lot more. And we, you know, we became close, close to this day. I just was, just was at his wedding uh, uh, this past summer. So, yeah, that's my, that's my so guy how, right there. But initially, how did you establish that relationship with, you know, you being a, a DC area guy and him being a kid from Alabama? How did you kind of, Establish that relationship. Out of New York, I wanted to do more. You got to remember by then I had been doing the training, and I kind of wanted to be on the management side, but I didn't know how to get mm-hmm. there. You know what I mean? Because by this time I had I had talked to people about their careers, and you know whether it be overseas or NBA, and why are you here? Why is this going? Get more involved. He was like, "Look, I got a kid for you. 
a kid. But he said the kid's crazy. I'm like, man, I ain't worried about no kid. You know what I mean? Hey, mm-hmm. talk his cousins. I was like, I love him. He like kid crazy. I said, I don't care. So Memorial Day classic. As fate would have it, DC Blue Devils was playing, uh, I forget the name of their team, uh, Birmingham Storm. And um, and we played them, and I was told to just kind of walk up to the mom and, you know, introduce yourself. Oh, my God. And I met her, and I was talking to her. We kind of hit it off good, you know, just, just you know, per conversation, you know. And the whole time mm-hmm. I'm talking to her, he is mean mugging me while he's dogging us out. He's mean mugging me. She's like, well, I don't worry about him. He uh, he he overprotective of me, and I'm like, oh okay, because you know the kid, he just looked angry. But I come to find out mm-hmm. that was just his coping mechanism. You know, he just didn't trust, and he 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 don't want no trouble. People should realize the moms don't want no trouble. He just don't want to be by anybody. That's pretty much the way he does things. So, yeah, nah, that's my guy. Like, I, I learned the most. Until Markel Fultz. But by the time I got Markel, by going through so many tough times with the Marcus, I knew the business inside and out. And I knew how how bad, how cruddy the business could be as well. Mm-hmm. So you, you mentioned Markel Fultz, the number one pick in the NBA draft. And, you know, I just want to go back real quick. I want to throw this question out there. You dealt with Steve. You trained Steve. You trained John Wall. You trained Markel. Out of the three, who's the most athletic? What did you say now? What was it? Who was the guys you said? Steve Francis, John Wall, Markel Fultz. Who out of those three, who would you say was the most athletic? A healthy John. A healthy John. Uh, I, it's probably a tie between John and Markel. And the reason why I say that before you before you like what? Steve wasn't special <laughs> off one leg, right? He primarily a two foot mm-hmm. jumper. Whereas John was so special, John jumped off the wrong foot. Remember, John is a really strong uh, right footed dunker, and then, yeah, and then Mark Hill with his length, he's he's longer than both of those guys. Actually, bigger than both of them guys coming into the NBA. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Steve was probably more, so a lot of more people, explosive, strong in the end than both of those guys. But I would say that, you know, John and John and them was they was they was going up. You get ready, John and them was uh, you coming in? Um, so I was yeah, I would say about the top. So you know, everyone in the area knows you for helping to develop Markel Fultz into the number one draft pick. So a question that I have always wanted to ask you, at some point it seemed as if the Sixers organization was blaming you for certain things that were dealing with him as a player. Uh-huh. How, did you, how did you kind of navigate that situation where it seemed like the Sixers organization kind of wanted to separate you from the player? I mean, that, So how did you I deal, mean, how did you deal with that? That's the nature of the business. Like, it's just not set up for, the, you know, and I don't want to make it a race thing, but it's just not set up. A guy in my position, those teams don't want to answer to. And at that time, even though Mark had an agent, the agent wasn't really strong. Everybody knew that I pretty much with Mark, whether it be a shoe deal, whatever it was, you know, stirring his situation with surgeries and stuff like that. Everybody knew that I was the go-to. And I think when when he went through his situation, I think the team got nervous because the stuff that happened with Ben and the stuff that happened with Joel. So I think they 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 finger point, you know, like they did with Jaleel Okafor. You know, they 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 wanted to the finger point, and I think it got worse when they realized I wasn't gonna back off. And I did an interview saying I don't know why to say that the person that taught the kid how to play. I said, but even if you say I changed the shot, why would I change the shot? They got to be number one. That was the biggest reason because he could shoot over guys. Why would I get him to shoot the ball from his shoulder? Like, that never made any sense. And I guess, obviously, ultimately, you know, I everybody realized, hey, he, you know, he had he had some other things going on. And so I'm glad it's over. But my, my thing was I wasn't going to do anything to make the kid look bad. Because at the end of the day, the kid was like a son to me. I mean, 
Markel's with me from, you know, seven years old up until the end. So he's on like 12 years. So I was willing to, you know, I was willing to take the bullet as long as he made out okay. Right. So at this point, like, what is that relationship like now? Was it a mutual, a mutual agreement for you to step back? Or was it something more so because of you You kind of said, you know what, I need to take a step back. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, what was that community? No, I, definitely, you know, I definitely took a step back and said, hey, you know, I don't want it to be messy. It was messy enough, you know, what he was going through. You got to somewhere to nowhere so quick. It was a lot. And, mm -hmm. and it was all positive up until that point. So, you know, I didn't want I didn't want it to get any worse. So I just I, I took a step back. And I'm glad that at, at the very least now he's playing. You know, he's not he's not who he was supposed to be yet, but he's playing and he seems comfortable and he he shows flashes of being you know, what he could be. So I'm, I'm I'm happy for him in that way, and I'm and I'm still rooting. Don't put in 12 years with somebody and it's just over just like that. It, you know. Yeah, so that's what makes me want to ask you, what is that relationship like now? Is it something where you still communicate with him? He reaches out to you? Like, what does that look like it's now? It's solid. It's solid. You know, it's solid. Like I said, it's, it's so much that's transpired. But it's solid, yeah. Well, that's good to hear. So now what are you doing? I, I know you're still training, but do you currently have any pros or are you just currently at this particular time to school kids? I, I, you have to right school now, kids? I'm just doing young kids. You know, I still see DeMarcus from time to time. Obviously, he's been injured for a while on and off. But uh, I got some young, good young kids and high school kids that got a chance to be really good. And so, I'm, hey, look, I'm going to make one more run at this training thing and try to get me a couple kids in the draft. I, I work with Kavon Hurd. So, I'm going to have some guys that's in the mix. I did some work with Anthony Cowan. Mm -hmm. But in terms of being at the forefront, nah, nobody right now. But I'm going to be involved in doing some pre draft stuff with some of these guys. I'm busy. I stay busy. You So you stay yeah. busy. Now, one question I've always had, because when we look at your Instagram, we can see you moving from gym uh -huh. to gym. How are, you, how are you able to get access to gyms? Because you know for most people, especially during the season, it's incredibly hard for kids to get in the gym to get get shot up, but you seem to always have a place. How are you able to do that? Um, I think I, I I've done so much good work that honestly I shouldn't say this on air, but I've never had to pay for a gym ever, ever. I mm -hmm. think I've done so much good work, and I've always offered my services to whomever was at that school, that facility, for free, in exchange for you know mm -hmm. time and stuff like that. So, yeah. So, so are you select? Are you selective with the kids no, you work out with, no. or is it open to anyone who contacts? Any level, yeah. Any level. So, if people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do so for training? I guess I got I got to go with the new find, but they can they can reach me on Instagram and Keith Williams nineteen fifty seven, and um, DM me. That's how, that's how the kids kind of do it now. So I'm I'm kind of following suit with what. I'm doing. 